let's stay with France for a minute. You, you go into France. France, the beaches of Normandy have had special meaning for your family, which you go into the book. And I think you, would you like to share a passage? Uh, I, I'd love to, but I'd love to explain to everybody. Um, <clears throat> I, I've been a student of war for a long time because of my early introduction to the war. I write in the book about how my first memory as a child is holding my mother's hand, walking through the ruins of the house that had been burned. And she took me back there in 1947. I'm four years old. And my two memories are one, holding her hand, feeling, hearing the glass, broken glass, crunching beneath our feet in grass that had grown up sort of knee high and walking through the rubble and just seeing a staircase going up into the sky and a chimney going up into the sky. And this was my first introduction to, to, to it all. And I didn't know why my mother was crying. It bothered me, obviously, as a kid, you know, why my mother was upset. Um, and, but that was indelible, that, that impression a broken house, bombed house, mother upset, tears, destruction. And outside the house uh, was a huge German bunker, which was a bunker looking over the water uh, near where the house was. And um, so my grandfather rebuilt the house after the war. And I have 20, I had 31 first cousins, I have 29 first cousins, all of us to this day still care for that house. We all share uh, the cost of running it and, and keep it going. And it's become a great uh, place for, for the family historically. But I would go back many times in my youth because of my being in Switzerland, being in Europe, being uh, following my father to our posts. And the result was, it was like having 29 brothers and sisters. We all grew up together over a long period of time. And I played in German bunkers. I, I went to various places where the bunkers were an exciting sightseeing tour. And we go through them. But the beaches of Normandy, my dad took me back to them as a little older. I remember seeing detritus of war on the beaches of Normandy. Burnt out Higgins boats, tanks, and things. They still hadn't cleared them. And so for me, always, it's been a sacred, unbelievable place. But as I grew up, and I read all the books, uh, The Longest Day, da da da, you name it, uh, Ambrose, everybody on, on the war, uh, and Churchill, and Eisenhower. Uh, you know, I think a lot about it. And then as a combatant who went to war, very different kind of war, I thought about the differences in how we were shot at versus that moment. Uh, you know, we were always ambushed. We were driving these 50-foot aluminum boats with twin diesel engines up the rivers, and we were just sort of holding our breath and waiting for the Viet Cong to shoot at us from the mangroves uh, and the bunkers that they would build. And we were constantly being shot at in that way, and we'd shoot back and kind of clear the fire zone to get out of the, out of the line of fire. But we weren't gaining much. I mean, this is part of what bothered me and began to turn me against the white. Yeah, I didn't think it was particularly strategic, particularly smart. And uh, one, of the, one of the awards that I got later on was because I was the officer in tactical command of three boats going up a river, tiny little river, not big. And um, we, were, we were ambushed. But I had learned by then to distinguish small arms fire from heavy caliber. You know, you knew a 50 caliber, and you knew a, an M60 and machine gun, and you knew the clack, clack, clack of an AK-47 or a carbine, Chinese com, chai com, we called them carbine. You could tell it very well. So I knew immediately that uh, there was no heavy caliber. And we talked about this with the other officers of the two other boats. And, and I said, you know, rather than just going by broadside, uh, if it's not, you know, depending on the size of the ambush, maybe we just turn towards them. And there's a lower profile, and we put our heavy guns on them. So I tried it. I, I just ordered all three boats, turn, 090, turn immediately. And by God, they did it. And we went 20 yards forward, beached right in the ambush, and we, we completely overran the ambush. We had troops on the back of our boat, too. We unloaded the troops and went after these guys on the shore. 
So this became a new sort of way that people started to think about how we, how we could deal with it. But to me, this is the point that comes back to Normandy, it's a whole different world. You know, I write about this in the book. Ernest Hemingway talked about how to be a good soldier. You have to suspend the imagination. If your imagination is so intense that you're imagining all the terrible things that are going to happen to you, you may not be a great soldier. But if you can suspend the ina- imagination, you can be a much better soldier. And, and, and I thought about that because we never knew when we were going to be shot at precisely. We could guess pretty much. You get in the river, you go a certain distance, but you didn't know. And we knew they were hiding in mud bunkers, and there were only X number of them, right? <clears throat> These guys at Normandy, folks, and I, I write about this because it just, I find it the most awesome, extraordinary, gift to our country, to the world, to the fight against fascism, to the fight for democracy. It's why we should care about veterans as, as much as I hope, and I think the country does more, more now than it did when we first came back. But now, there's the, that ethics, you know, very high. It wasn't uh, all the period of time. But the point I make is that in those Higgins boats, on that gray day, off the coast of France, when those guys were lowered down to the boats and bobbing around for hours while everybody got loaded until they started into the beach. And then they start into the beach and guys are being seasick and they're cold and they're wet and they're driving towards this incredible beach and there's a huge bluff up above it filled with these concrete fortresses with artillery and machine guns and, and you know, you can't penetrate it. And you know, because you see a boat get blown up 20 yards off to your right and 30 yards to your left, and the whole boat goes up in the air and everybody in it is killed. And you're still going forward towards that beach. And then the door drops and half the people in that boat, or all of them, are dead within seconds. You know, it, and, and you forge ahead trying to get up that beach and you're pinned down on the beach. And those of you who saw Saving Private Ryan, you, you get a little sense of that. Um, uh, it's, it's, to me, you know, they're just extraordinary. That was the most awesome display of courage and determination on behalf of our nation and the nations we were fighting with to beat back evil. Now, I don't take anything away from guys who've gone to Iraq, Iran. Uh, those, war is war, and it's horrible. It's terrible, no matter where it is. And those guys are heroic. And every single one of them deserves what they do. But there is a qualitative difference between a tiny boat and a door dropping and a fortress in front of you and the knowledge that in a few minutes you're going to be dead. Not maybe blown up by an IED or whatever, but you're going to be dead. And you still do it. That's a gift, folks. So I wrote because they deserve it. But I hope I can get through this piece, because Teresa and I went back. Teresa, my wife, we were not yet married, but we had gone to France. We were seeing each other. And um, I wanted her to share my sense of reverence for the history of this place. And so we went there. And here is what I wrote. Because it was September, there weren't that many people. The setting is always breathtaking. And when you are walking almost by yourselves amid the crosses and stars of David, noting the dates of death and the names engraved on the headstones, the emotional and historical sweep of the place overwhelms you. We went all the way down to a near deserted part of the beach where troops had broken through on D-Day. There we sat on some rocks at the edge of the beach. The tide was rising, and we measured each wave as it reached closer and closer to the rocks. The entire time we were there, mesmerized by the stillness and the beauty. An older gentleman, and we presumed his wife, were sitting together in an embrace, looking out at the water, not moving, lost in thought. I am certain he was a returned veteran, someone who survived that extraordinary landing, someone who had come back to find peace and perhaps remember the friends he had lost at that very place. Quietly but deliberately, he stood up, He took off all his clothes, piece by piece. Then, completely naked, with a squeeze of his wife's hand, 
He walked straight out into the water, unabashed, unembarrassed, without awareness of anybody watching, lost in his memories in the moment. He seemed to be performing a ritual purification, allowing the waves to carry him in and out as they had once washed soldiers' bodies back and forth until the dead were finally recovered after the fighting on the beach. Teresa and I holding hands. Watched in silence. We were frozen in that spot on the beach as if for an eternity. To this day, it is one of the most touching, beautiful moments we have ever witnessed together. It was mystical and a gift. That's what I think that place means, and I think it's something people in our country need to sort of stop and find a way to grab onto and get a hold of as we think about what's happening in Washington. I don't mean to bring it back, but folks, think of the bigness of that. Think of the extraordinary nature of, of, of people putting themselves on the line like that, and then you see the squabbling and the pettiness and the distance from the American people that that place is. Uh, you know, I wish there was a way to, to break through on that, but we've got to bring our country back together. We've got to find a way to do our nation's business, uh, and that's how we're going to make our country stronger and better. The only way I know.